warning. This video contains potentially triggering content, such as abuse, sexual assault, dismemberment, murder, crime scene, and autopsy descriptions and details. Viewer discretion is advised. Greetings, boils and ghouls. Today's True Crime Files episode is about the case that sparked my interest in true crime. This case led me down some serious rabbit holes and gave me a bit of an obsession that has lasted to this day. Real quick, I'm going to let everybody know that this started when I was like 15. <laughs> I am, I'm 31. Anyway, today's episode is about the Black Dahlia. B! Yes. You ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. Let's go. All right. Elizabeth Short was born July 29th, 1924. I'm skipping a bunch of details about her early life and starting with her life in 1942 to give some details about the few years before her murder. And also, but her early life is her early life. It's not. This is about her murder. So. It's not relevant. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's kind of mean to say, but it's one of those things where it's just like, this is about her murder, not her entire self. So in December of 1942, when she was 18, Elizabeth Short moved to Vallejo, California to live with her father. Hmm. Okay, there are a lot of things I have to find out in this that I might get wrong, just warning everybody ahead of time. And I'm laughing because I'm nervous, not because I think murder is funny. So yeah, she moved to Vallejo, California to live with her dad. However, arguments between her and her father led to her moving out in January of 1943. Just a, just a bit of background information there. Her dad left her, her and her mom and her sisters and then faked his death. Wait, yeah. why? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but Who yeah, does that? <laughs> he, did, he faked his death. And then like when she was a teenager around the, you know, I think 16 or 17, he was he sent her a letter and was like, hey, by the way, not dead. Love you, dad. Yeah, no, I'd be like, nah, nah, see, <laughs> nah, mm -mm, nope. <laughs> you are you are dead to me at this point now, sir. You've been dead for like, she was like a, like a young child when he did this shit. So, yeah, <laughs> it's insanity to me. But yeah, he just came back and he was like, oh, by the way, not dead. I live in California. Come live with me. And she's like, okay, sure. And I'm over here like, why? Why would you? But anyways, they argued a lot, apparently. And I'm assuming it's because, you know, I feel like when parents um, aren't in their child's life a lot and their child becomes an adult and they start to reconnect, they, they try to parent them again, which you can't do once they're an adult. <laughs> yeah, they tend to overdo it. Yeah, they, yeah, they get, hmm. It's one of those things where it's just kind of like, if you wanted to be a dad or a mom, you probably should have done that while they were a child, just saying. So she she moved out. She then, she took a job at the base exchange at Camp Cook, now known as the Vandenberg Air Force Base near Lompoc, living with several friends and for a short time with an Army Air Force sergeant who was allegedly abusive with her. She then left Lompoc in 1943, moving to Santa Barbara, where she was arrested for underage drinking on September 23rd of that same year. I can't really blame her for it, though. <laughs> there is uh, there's speculation that she wasn't actually drinking, but she was in a bar. Because you can you're be at a in bar. a bar at 18 if you don't drink. That's what I'm saying. I, there, I don't know if it's been confirmed or not, because I didn't see that, if she was actually drinking, but she was arrested for it, so who knows. The juvenile authorities sent her back to Medford, Massachusetts, which is where she was before she moved uh, to out to her dad. Uh, that's where her mom and her sisters are. But Miss Short decided to go to Florida instead. No one ever should go to Florida willingly. Sorry, um, Floridians. <laughs> this was back in the 40s, where I'm pretty sure Florida was probably a bit more pleasant. Yeah, probably. To white people and no one else. <laughs> True. Let, let's be honest. She decided to go to Florida instead. In Florida, she met Major Matthew Michael Gordon Jr. That's a hell of a name. A decorated Army Air Force officer at the Second Air Commando Group. She told her friends that Gordon had written to propose marriage while he was recovering from injuries from a plane crash in India. She accepted, but Gordon uh, died in a second crash 
on August 10, 1945, less than a week before the surrender of Japan ended the war. Well, that's depressing. That's so depressing. So, like, it would seem that her life is, is pretty rough in these years. She relocated to Los Angeles in July 1946 to visit Army Air Force Lieutenant Joseph Warden Fickling. Stop going for military guys. I'm telling you, lady. <laughs> but she had known him from Florida, and she spent the last six months of her life in Southern California, mostly in the L.A. area. Shortly before her death, she had been working as a waitress, and she rented a room behind the Florentine Garden nightclub on Hollywood Boulevard. Elizabeth Short has been described and depicted as an aspiring, as an aspiring or would-be actress, and according to some sources, she did in fact have aspirations to be a film star, though she had no, no known acting jobs or credits. And to be honest, these claims have never really been confirmed. But I feel like that's something that's really often associated with the Black Dahlia Killer, with like, oh, this aspiring actress cut down in the prime of life, brutally murdered. You know, I, I feel like they, they use that to sensationalize her death, and I'm kind of like please stop i feel like that's just kind of rude to sensationalize people in their death oh isn't it so tragic that this would-be actress died before she ever made it big and i'm like how about it just be tragic that she's brutally murdered they don't care about the normal person they have to be you know famous or up and coming or they have to be aspiring or exactly yeah <laughs> That's annoying. Uh, moving on. On January 9th, 1947, Elizabeth Short returned to her home in Los Angeles after a brief trip to San Diego with Robert, a.k.a. Red, Manley, a 25-year-old married salesman she had been dating. And that's where it went wrong. <laughs> if he killed her, then yes. <laughs> or his wife. Who knows? Manley stated that he dropped her off at the Biltmore Hotel located at 506 South Grand Avenue in downtown L.A. And that Miss Short was to meet her sister, who was visiting from Boston that afternoon. Staff of the Biltmore recalled having seen Miss Short using the lobby telephone. And shortly after, she was allegedly seen at the Crown Grill Cocktail Lounge at 754 south olive street approximately 0.4 miles away from the biltmore hotel now this doesn't really have anything to do with the case but interesting little tidbit <laughs> apparently the biltmore hotel is reportedly very haunted and there are people who claim that they've seen elizabeth short there you know her ghost i mean if she was brutally murdered are we surprised right but then like the question then becomes I don't think she was murdered near the hotel. <laughs> and like she was killed in the hotel, which is a possibility because no one knows where she was actually murdered. We just know where her body was found. So it's a possibility still. It is a possibility. But yeah, people have reported seeing her in like this long black dress and her black hair. And she's very pale. And she's very beautiful. And they're just like, oh, there she is. <laughs> and I got to be honest, I would like to go there one day try to experience it for myself maybe talk to the people who work there and be like hey how hot it is this place but that's that's for another day now on to a grizzly murder on the morning of january 15th 1947 elizabeth short's naked body was found severed into two pieces on a vacant lot on the west side of south norton avenue midway between Coliseum Street and West 39th Street and Le Mer Park, L.A. At the time, the neighborhood was largely unde undeveloped. Local resident Betty Bersinger discovered the body at approximately 10 a.m. while walking with her three-year-old daughter. Ms. Bersinger initially thought she had found a discarded store mannequin, but when she realized it was a corpse, she rushed to a nearby house and called the police. How do you mistake a human being for a mannequin? Okay, so the reason for that, apparently, is she was completely drained of all her blood, and so she was such a inhuman, pale, you know, color, like her skin was, that she didn't look real. That's morbid as hell. What? Wait, 
Where did you put the blood? What? I, <laughs> where did you put the blood? I mean, that's a good question. <laughs> oh, just get just get ready for the autopsy report because it's oh, it's gnarly. Ah, okay. Elizabeth Short. This is just like how she was found at the scene, and uh, <laughs> the autopsy report is after this. Elizabeth Short's severely mutilated body was completely severed at the waist and drained of blood, leaving her skin white as a sheet. Medical examiners determined that she had been dead for around 10 hours prior to the discovery, leaving her time of death either sometime during the evening of January 14th or the early morning hours of January 15th. Her body had apparently been washed by the killer, and her face had been slashed from the corners of her mouth all the way up to her ears, creating an effect known as the Glasgow smile. So- oh, God. Oh, yeah? You, you okay? <laughs> oh, what? Oh, why? Why would you do that? That motherfucker was sadistic, yo. Also, for those out there wondering, um, the Glasgow smile, uh, people have also likened it to the Joker smile. She also had several cuts on her thigh and her chest, where entire portions of flesh had been sliced away. What did this woman do to you to possess <laughs> you to mutilate someone? Do this. Do this. Yeah. It's just like, who hurt you? Like, this isn't a normal murder. Like, you are seriously messed up if you can sit there for hours and just cut somebody in half, drain their blood, rip off pieces of flesh. Mm-hmm. What? What? Why? And that's just, not just any flesh. Her, her boobs I- are just, they were, mm, yeah. But yeah, this person had to have been just messed the hell up to mutilate a body like that. Because why? What the hell? Why are you so angry? Uh, the lower half of her body was positioned about a foot away from the upper half. And her intestines had been tucked neatly beneath her bottom. How the- considerate of you. Right? Like, thanks, I guess. The corpse had been posed with her hands above her head, her elbows bent at right angles, and her legs spread apart. So, because of the legs being spread apart, they immediately considered this to be a sex crime. The autopsy report. Elizabeth Short's autopsy was performed on January 16, 1947 by Frederick Newbar, the L.A. County coroner. Newbar's autopsy report stated that Short was 5 feet 5 inches tall, weighed 115 pounds, and had light blue eyes, brown hair, and badly decayed teeth. There were ligature marks on her ankles, wrist, and neck, and an irregular laceration with superficial tissue loss on her right breast. Newbar also noted that superficial lacerations on the right forearm, left upper arm, and also noted, sorry, superficial lacerations on the right forearm, left upper, upper arm, and the lower side, lower left side of the chest. The body had been cut completely in half by a technique taught in the 1930s called a hemicorporectomy. I think I said that right. <laughs> the lower half of her body had been removed by transecting the lumbar spine between the second and third lumbar vertebrae, thus severing the intestine at the duodenum. Newbar's report noted very little ecchymosis also known as bruising, along the incision line, uh, suggesting it had been performed after death, which is a small mercy. Another gaping laceration measuring 4.25 inches in length ran longitudinally from the umbilicus to the suprapubic region. The lacerations on each side of the face, which extended from the corners of the lips, were measured at three inches on the right side of the face and two and a half inches on the left. Jeez. I know. This is, this is gnarly. The skull was not fractured, but there was bruising noted on the front and right side of her scalp with a small amount of bleeding in the subarachnoid space on the right side, consistent with blows to the head. 
the cause of death was determined to be hemorrhaging from the lacerations to her face and the shock from blows to the head and face. And that, this, is, this is where I feel like I should be flashing the trigger warning sign because uh, you, you'll, you'll know in a minute. Newbar noted that Short's anal canal was dilated at 1.75 inches, suggesting she may have been raped. Samples were taken from her body, testing for the presence of sperm, but the results came back negative. And here's the other thing. It mentioned earlier, I mentioned, sorry, earlier that her body had been washed. Her body had been washed, like wiped down with gasoline to destroy all evidence which apparently uh, worked because they didn't find anything off of her. I, I can't with whoever did this, male, female, I, what is wrong with you? Who hurt you so badly that you did this to a poor, innocent girl? Right? Thank God he never, wait, well, you know what? I, I will fully admit that I know nothing of black, about the black Dahlia as, you know, a true crime nut. I know nothing about this. But I'm assuming this was only like a one and done. We hope because there might have been other murders that they did, but that yeah. it's the 40s, so it's kind of not that easy to link them all. True, but it is highly suspected, and and I will mention them a bit later. So yeah, she's been, <laughs> this this poor woman. Now, yeah, the poor innocent woman, whether she was innocent or not, which the media will, as I'll, blah, literally in like less than a paragraph or two, I will explain what the media did to sensationalize it. But it doesn't matter if she was innocent or not. She didn't deserve to die. Especially like this. Yeah. No one deserves to die like this. I don't care how horrible of a person you are. No, nah, there, there are humane ways to deal with the worst of society, and this ain't it. Prior to the autopsy, police had quickly been able to identify the victim as Miss Short after sending copies of her fingerprints to Washington, D.C., and the prints matched those given by, uh, by Miss Short during her 1943 arrest you know, for underage drinking. Alleged. Alleged underage drinking, which, I mean, is kind of what the you know, in retrospect, a good thing to happen because they identified her pretty quickly. The good thing to come out of this. <laughs> yeah. Immediately following her identification, reporters from William Randolph Hearst, Los Angeles Examiner, contacted her mother, Phoebe Short, and now here's a really fucked up thing they did. They told her that her daughter had won a beauty contest. They got as much personal information as they could about Elizabeth from her mom before they were just like, hey, by the way, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your daughter is dead. She's been murdered. Why would you do that? I, I don't know. I mean, I guess they wanted to, um, they wanted the scoop and they wanted all this information about her so they could put out some sensational newspaper about the Black Dahlia tragic victim. Which, I mean, she was a tragic victim, but Holy crap, people. Again, it's, I keep saying this, but it's true. It's the 40s. If that should happen today, that whoever, whatever reporter did that shit would be put on blast all over the internet. Oh, yeah, for sure. You don't do that shit these days. You shouldn't have done that shit back in the fucking 40s, but no. they wanted the information. I guess they felt like if they were like, hey, your daughter has been horrifically murdered. Can you tell us about her? <laughs> they were probably worried that the mom, you know, her mom would be too upset to answer any questions, which is, hmm, that's not even, that's not even the worst part. I mean, it is really bad, but it get, it doesn't, it doesn't get better. Uh, the newspaper offered to pay her airfare and accommodations if she would travel to Los Angeles to help with the police investigation. That was yet another ploy. Since the newspaper kept her away from police and other reporters to protect its scoop. I'm angry. 
As you should be. Because <laughs> her mom probably could have helped with the investigation. And they just were like, no, don't go there. We, we know we told you to come out here and help, but don't do it. <laughs> what? The Examiner and another Hearst newspaper, the Los Angeles Her- Herald Express, later sensationalized the case, with one article from the Examiner describing the black tailor suit Miss Short was last seen wearing as a tight skirt and a sheer blouse. The media nicknamed her as the Black Dahlia and described her as an adventuress who prowled Hollywood Boulevard. <sighs> Ew. Additional... <laughs> Newspaper reports, such as one published in the uh, Los Angeles Times on January 17th, deemed the murder a sex fiend slaying. What the hell is wrong with reporters? It's what? Ew. This is gross. It's just gross. I I left that in there so people would know how gross this is. Or what? Get a hobby. Get a a hobby. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) Ugh. So now, now we move on to the investigation and the letters. January 21st, a, uh, 1947, a person claiming to be the killer placed a phone call to the office of James Richardson, the editor of The Examiner, congratulating him on the newspaper's coverage of the case and stated that he planned on eventually turning himself in, but not before allowing police to pursue him further. Additionally, the caller told Richardson to expect some souvenirs of Beth Short in the mail. So, as soon (laughs) as this case gets reported in the newspaper, a motherfucker is already calling up the examiner and being like, (laughs) I did it. Where do people get off doing that? I never understood why people who don't commit the crime call and be like, hey, I did it, and make these police just work extra hard for what? Because you're an asshole? Like, come on, dude. Why are you like this? Who hurt you? <laughs> that seems to be the com- that's probably going to be our most asked question during these cases, these, you know, these files that we go through, is who hurt you? Do Why you need you- a hug? Do you need a hug? <laughs> Why are you like this? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Most of it is attention seeking. Most of it is uh, the infamy. Yeah, they want to see their name or they want to be reported on, preferably anonymously, because if they gave their actual names and they didn't do it, they're going to jail for something they didn't do. But, however, three days later, on January 24th, a suspicious envelope was discovered by a U.S. Postal Service worker. The envelope had been addressed to the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers with individual words that had been cut and pasted from newspaper clippings because... Oh, they did that. Okay, yeah, see, I know about that part. Mm -hmm. Uh, Additionally, a large message on the face of the envelope read, here is Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow. The envelope contained her birth certificate, some business cards, uh, photographs, names written on pieces of paper, and an address book with the name Mark Hansen embossed on the cover. The packet had been carefully cleaned with gasoline, similarly to her body, which led police to suspect the packet had been sent directly by her killer. Wait, are they assuming this because they never released to the public that her body was washed in gasoline? Yes, they kept a lot. They actually kept a lot out of the public, like her actual cause of death. They kept that secret so that anybody they interviewed, you know, they would be like, oh, well, you know, you claimed you killed her. How did she die? And they would keep those things. Yeah, they've been doing that for a long time. (laughs) Which it it helps the case sometimes Mm -hmm. because then you don't have copycats or people who apparently, you know, love the attention do it. But it also make, I think it could make things difficult too. I, I agree. All right. Oh, so they're thinking that the caller was legit the killer because he was like, oh, well, you know, expect some souvenirs from her. And they're sent this packet that's cleaned 
much like she was clean with the gasoline. And hmm. yeah, so they're thinking, oh, this dude's definitely the killer. But in my mind, maybe maybe they weren't the killer. Maybe they were just an associate. Or they were just someone who knows the gasoline cleaning trick. How common is that? I don't Oh, I yeah. Don't. By the way, if you want to get rid of all the evidence, clean, clean the body with gasoline. Well, okay, hold on. Anybody who is listening to this, if you're a true crime fan and you're messed up in the head, please don't do this. <laughs> don't. We do not advocate actual murders. Yes, no. Please, please don't kill people and use gasoline on a body, especially <laughs> on the West Coast right now, okay? <laughs> we don't need you contributing to more fires, y'all. No. Jesus. Similar, uh, yeah, 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 I already said all that. However, several partial fingerprints were lifted from the envelope. Yeah, because they didn't clean it that well, apparently. And sent to the FBI for testing. However, again, the prints were compromised in transit and could not be properly analyzed. Thank you for probably screwing up one of the easiest things you could have. I but know. The- I know. Mm. Um, I, I, so, just for transparency's sake, my, the, my entire script came from Wikipedia. <laughs> Shut up, it's valid. And... <laughs> However, I did also watch uh, many, many documentaries and other people's videos about this to basically kind of cross-reference everything and uh, make sure everything was correct. But, yeah. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. the um, In one of the documentaries, an investigator, like, from today, it was either an investigator or a judge, sat there and said, if this case if this murder had happened today like in present time it would have been solved no question oh yeah like it would have been solved it might have taken a couple of years but it would it it would have been solved (laughs) and this is still technically an unsolved murder y'all this dude wasn't even that good of a killer he really wasn't he fucked up enough to where he tried to clean off his fingerprints they still found fingerprints they're shipping them off to the fbi whoopsies compromised in transit and i'm like that could have that could have gotten them the killer that could have done it now they do say that uh somebody else or maybe it was the same person uh sent him something and they took their fingerprints or maybe it was fingerprints off her body i'm not entirely sure where the thing this was a different video this, that's why i didn't write it down but they did put any fingerprints they found that they could analyze. They put them in the system. There were no matches. So that's fun. <laughs> However, if they had their fingerprints, if they had their fingerprints on a file, they, they had a lot of suspects, by the way. They could have, you know, they could have ran those suspects' fingerprints against the finger. You know, they could have... They could have found the killer. <laughs> this is a different time, though. Like, it's a different know, it was almost a hundred years ago. Let let that sink in. This is almost a hundred years ago now. Oh God, this is like what eighty years. Mm-hmm. Things have progressed since then. Like it's so easy now to catch someone. It's very hard to commit the perfect crime. You can't do this where it's like Jack the Ripper, the Black Dahlia, the Zodiac Killer. You can't have that anymore. No. <laughs> so they fucked up the fingerprints. Of course they did. The same day, the packet was received by the examiner. A handbag and a black suede shoe were reported to have been to have been seen on top of a garbage can in an alley about two miles from where uh, Elizabeth Short's body had been discovered. The items were recovered by police, but they had also been wiped clean with gasoline. Shocker! Shocker! Destroying any fingerprints. Again, shocker. <laughs> So this is somebody claiming credit for the Black Dahlia killing. And this is just kind of like a weird little incident here. 
On March 14th, an apparent suicide note was found tucked into a shoe in a pile of men's clothing by the ocean's edge at the foot of Breeze Avenue, Venice. The note read, To whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but they have not. I am too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself for that or this. Sorry, Mary. The clothes included a coat and trousers of blue herringbone tweed, a brown and white Y shirt, white jockey shoes, tan socks, and tan moccasin leisure shoes, size about eight. The clothes gave z- no clue, zero clue about the identity of the owner. Also, I don't think the person who mutilated this woman would be a coward. I don't, I, I'm too much of a coward to turn myself in, so I'm going to kill myself instead. I don't... I also think he, he or she, we don't know, I guess, um, is too, they're too conceited to want to kill themselves. Let's be honest. Oh, for sure. This is, this is somebody who is, this killing was probably very personal to them. And they went, they could have just stabbed her and been done with it. But no, they went that far with her death. Oh my God. (laughs) They are conceited. I mean, and if it's the same person, if these are all the same person calling up the newspaper and taunting people, taunting police with letters and things, like, that person is not going to kill themselves if it's the same person. I personally believe that this might have been the same person, might have actually been the killer, but they didn't kill themselves. This was just a setup. This was just something to throw them off the track. Yeah. Oh. Uh, police quickly deemed Mark Hansen, the owner of the address book found in the packet, a suspect, as you would do. Hansen was a wealthy local nightclub and theater owner and an acquaintance of uh, Elizabeth Short. And according to some sources, he also confirmed that the purse and shoe discovered in the alley were in fact hers. And talk, Miss Short's friend and roommate, told investigators that Miss Short had recently rejected sexual advances from Hansen and suggested it as a potential motive. However, he was cleared of suspicion in the case. Not entirely sure how, but apparently he just was. I mean, just because you're rejected doesn't give you the means to kill someone. No, and Not everyone mean- is an, an asshole who will kill you or beat you over you saying, you know what? No, I'm good. Yeah. So, I mean... I get why she was like, well, he was mad that she, you know, she turned him down. Maybe he did it. I would like to know how they removed him as a suspect, but I guess it doesn't matter. He was cleared of suspicion. In addition to Hanson, the Los Angeles Police Department interviewed over 150 men in the ensuing weeks whom they believed to be potential suspects. 150 men. How many of them did she actually know? Red Manley, remember him? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was the yeah he was like the last the married guy she was dating and the last person to see her alive or one of them. Uh, he was also investigated, but he was cleared of suspicion after passing many polygraph t- uh, tests. Which I just want people to know. And I'm not sitting here trying to say he did it, but I just want people to know that polygraph tests don't mean shit. Yeah, you can fake those super easy. You can fake them and you can fail them. Oh, yeah. Because if you have anxiety, I mean, obviously, it's going to jump all over the place. Yeah, uh, polygraph tests, all they, uh, all they do is they measure, like, your heartbeat, and your breathing rate, and your pulse, and it was just your heartbeat, and things like that. They don't, hmm. Well, that's why it's not really, like, hardcore evidence anymore in the courtroom. Like, no, it could be you, supporting. Yeah, if you, no, if you, not, not even that. If you take polygraph tests, to the court and try to submit them as evidence, they will laugh you out of court. They won't accept it because they can be faked either way. You can be too nervous to give a proper examination and fail. You could be, you know, you could be Good lying the entire time. You <laughs> yeah, you could be lying the entire time and pass it anyway because you're calm. Yeah. Like, it's just a polygraph test or bullshit. Just letting everybody know. 
I don't believe that Red did it. Police also interviewed several persons found listed in Hanson's address book, including a Martin Lewis, who had been another acquaintance of Shorts, of Elizabeth Shorts. Lewis was able to provide an alibi, however, as he was in Portland, Oregon, visiting his father-in-law, who was dying of kidney failure. So, here's just some, like, background, or not background information, but, like, just, just to let you know how big this case was. A total of 750 investigators from the LAPD and other departments worked on this case during its initial stages, Jeez. including 400 sheriff deputies and 250 California State Patrol officers. Various locations were searched for potential evidence, including storm drains throughout LA, abandoned structures, and various sites along the Los Angeles River. But the searches yielded no further evidence because why would they? Let's just not catch a break in this case. City Councilman Lloyd G. Davis posted a $10,000, which is equivalent to $114,501 in, in 2019 That's reward. That's insane. <laughs> right? But yeah, that was the reward he posted for information leading, uh, leading police to the killer. After the announcement of the reward, various persons, uh, obviously, came forward with confessions, most of which police dismissed as false. Of course, everybody wants a piece of that money now. Oh, yeah. Several of the false confessors were charged with obstruction of justice, which they should have been. I was going to say, I'm, wonder I'm waiting for that, because if you yeah. keep doing it, eventually you're going to get in trouble for it. Of course. I mean, you are, what you're, when you go in and you give a false confession, you are taking police's time and energy away from focusing on who the actual killer is. Yeah. And finding them and bringing them to justice. That is, yeah, just don't. How about you don't? Uh, oh, on January 26th, yet another letter was received by the examiner. This time it was handwritten, which read, here it is, turning in Wednesday, January 29th, 10 a.m. Had my fun at police, Black Dahlia Avenger. Why would you call yourself the Black Dahlia Avenger if you killed her? Mm -hmm. And it was handwritten. This one was handwritten, yes. So, which is a big mistake. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, yeah, I just, it really does weird me out when people, are, when, that he called himself that. Because it's, it's, if you were to avenge the Black Dahlia, you would be the person trying to find the killer mm -hmm. and dispense vigilante justice, one would assume. So, mm -hmm. If you're the killer, why did you call yourself the Black Dahlia Avenger? I don't understand you, person. I don't, I don't, I don't think I want to, but I, I just don't. <laughs> I don't understand you, and I don't think I want to understand you. I just wish you were a normal person. None of these people are normal. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, <laughs> the letter also named a location at which the supposed killer would turn himself in. Police waited there on the morning of January 29th, but the alleged killer did not appear. Shocker. <laughs> Instead, at 1 p.m., the examiner officers received another cut-and-pasted letter, which, what? You, you've, you've already sent a handwritten letter. Why are you now sending a cut-and-pasted one? Because he, he realized he messed up. <laughs> Probably. Uh, which read, have changed my mind. You would not give me a square deal. Dahlia killing was justified, which again, you cannot call yourself the Black Dahlia Avenger if you, ne never mind, um, I could go off on that for days. So, the graphic nature of the crime and the subsequent letters received by the examiner had resulted in a media frenzy surrounding Elizabeth Short's murder. Both local and national publications covered the story heavily, many of which reprinted, reprinted sensationalistic reports suggesting that Miss Short had been tortured for hours prior to her death. Which was not true. Yet police allowed the reports to circulate so as to conceal the true cause of death, cerebral hemorrhage, from the public. Which, I f like we said, or we talked about earlier, I feel like that can both help and hurt your case. You yeah. know, you're, when, you, when you allow the papers to just give whatever they want, you know, whatever mm -hmm. theories they want and pass it off as fact, you are spreading 
misinformation and you're letting them spread misinformation and that's just mm, it doesn't sit right with me no you don't have to tell anybody what the actual cause of death was but you could have come out and been like hey that's not true which would have been simple to do but instead they were just like oh no 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 let's just be mm, assholes and peddle misinformation further reports about her personal life were publicized including details about her alleged declining of Hanson's romantic advances additionally a stripper who was an acquaintance of Miss Shorts, told police that she liked to get guys worked up over her, but she'd leave them hanging dry. This You're much- a stripper. <laughs> you do the same thing. I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> but, like, you do the same thing. I, I feel like you're being a little accusatory towards this, this young woman here. <laughs> just a little. This, now, here's the... Here's, mm, this is just... Make, kind of makes you want to slap the money. This led some reporters and detectives to look into the possibility that Elizabeth Short was a lesbian. Because she totally doesn't have a string of military guys that she was with before this. Or, just, or a married man. She was with a married dude. She's not a lesbian just because she doesn't want you, dude. I'm sorry. That's not <laughs> how this works. Exactly. She ain't gay just because she don't want your D. But yeah, this made me want to slap somebody when I read it. And, uh, Oh yeah, they began questioning employees and patrons of gay bars in Los Angeles. This claim, however, remained un- unsubstantiated. Gee, I wonder why. Totally not because it's false. I mean, if, if she, even if she was. Who, well, yeah, even if she was, that has nothing to do with this. I mean, like, okay, say that she was gay, or that she was a lesbian, and... A guy hits on her. She says, ha ha, no. You know, she gets them all worked up and wild up and stuff. And then she tells him no, you know, because she's gay. Maybe she tells him she prefers women or maybe she doesn't. Either way. And then that guy kills her. Mm-hmm. What does her being gay actually have to do with finding her killer? I'm, I'm just, I'm wondering. <laughs> you find all the homophobes. Oh, wait, it was the 40s. Never mind. You find all the homophobes. You mean everyone? Everyone. <laughs> Pretty much everybody is sitting there just being like, oh, gay, huh? <laughs> That's shocking and immoral. Shut up and go away. What's funny is that there are there were actually quite a bit of people who were just kind of like, okay, I don't give a shit. But it's the loudest people who are remembered. Mm-hmm. The Herald Express also received several letters from the purported killer, again made with cut and pasted <sighs> clippings, one of which read, I will give up on Dahlia killing if I get 10 years, don't try to find me. On February 1st, the Los Angeles Daily News reported that the case had run into a stone wall with no new leads for investigators to pursue. The examiner continued to run stories on the murder and the investigation, which was front page news for 35 days following the discovery of her body. Uh, when interviewed, lead investigator Captain Jack Donahue told the press that he believed Elizabeth Short's murder had taken place in a remote building or a shack on the outskirts of Los Angeles and her body had then been transported into the city where it was disposed of. Based on the precise cuts and and dissection of her corpse, the LAPD looked into the possibility that the murderer may have been a surgeon, doctor, or someone with medical knowledge. Which makes sense when, you know, when when I read the autopsy report of how, where she was severed at the spine. Yeah, it takes some skill to know how to do that. Yeah, it's... It was a clean cut. Especially, so, and then they drained the blood. So, like, mm-hmm. it's very medical. It's not some just psychopath who is killing someone, because those are always messy. This is very strategic. This is very clean. This is very well thought out. This would probably, and maybe not her actual murder, like, the blows about the head. Mm-hmm. Maybe someone beat her because they were mad. But this, that whole part, the whole cutting her up, and draining on the body and then putting, you know, disposing her body and posing it afterwards. That all seems incredibly deliberate. Yeah. You know, incredibly planned out, incredibly like, you know, so the question becomes who, who, who killed her? You know, were they somebody who knew her and got mad at her because she wouldn't put out maybe or for whatever other reason and angrily attacked her? She ended up dying. Oh, shit. What do I do? And then, like, medi- you know, they had some medical knowledge that took over. Mm-hmm. And they were like, well, we must do, let's do this. And it will help with, you know, confusing the fuck out of everybody. Or was it somebody who is just 
looking for someone to kill. Like, they had been planning this for a while, and they just happened upon her. She was just unlucky. Yeah. Or could it have been, like, a combination of the two? Somebody that who knew her, and they were planning to kill her for a while. You don't really know, and that's kind of upsetting. Because I have this belief that um, the dead can never really rest, especially the murdered dead can never really rest until you know what happened to them until their story is told and completed and i just feel bad for this woman because you know if she's not able to rest until this is settled then holy she's been 80 years in mid-february 1947 the lapd served a warrant to the university of southern california medical school which was located near the site where her body had been discovered requesting a complete list of the program students. The university agreed so long as the students' identities remain private. Background checks were conducted, but of course, they yielded no results. Okay, so suspects. Suspects remaining under discussion by various authors and experts include a doctor named Walter Bailey, Times publisher Norman Chandler, who uh, biographer Donald Wolf claimed impregnated Elizabeth Short, <laughs> Leslie Dillon, Joseph A. Dumas, Artie Lane, also known as Jeff Connors for some reason, Mark Hansen, Dr. Francis E. Sweeney, Woody Guthrie, Bugsy Siegel, Orson Welles of all people, George Hodel, Hodel's friend Fred Sexton, George Knowlton, Robert M. Red Manley, Patrick S. O'Reilly, and Jack Anderson Wilson. Now, it's probably George Hodel, out of all those people I've told you about. And I'll tell you why. Police came to consider George Hill Hodel, is it Hodel or Hodel? George Hill Hodel Jr. a suspect after the 1947 murder of Elizabeth Short. He was never formally charged with the crime and came to wider attention as a suspect after his death when he was accused of killing Miss Short and of committing several additional murders by his own son, who is L.A. homicide detective Steve Hodel. Now, here's the other thing. Uh, I listened to George uh, Hodel talk about this whole thing himself. Not George. I didn't listen to him. I listened to his son, Steve. Sorry. I, you can't listen to George. He's been dead for a minute. But uh, I listened to his, his son, Steve, talk about it. And he said that he actually started this whole thing trying to prove that his dad didn't do it because like the past uh, the last few years before his dad i didn't think of his years might have just might have just been months but recently before his dad died he and his dad you know george had gotten really close and he wanted to prove that his dad didn't have anything to do with this but he uh steve found that the you know the more he went digging the more you know evidence and everything the more he you know investigated this case the more things seemed to point him in the direction of his father being the killer and there are people out there who might sit there and go oh well steve you know just had a vendetta against his dad well i'm about to tell you why George is a piece of shit. So prior to the Dahlia case, he was uh, George Hodel. Hodel. I'm not gonna say his name right, probably this entire time, but oh well. Prior to the case, he was also a suspect in the death of his secretary, Ruth Spalding, but was not charged and was also accused. Real quick, trigger warning for child abuse. Of raping his own daughter, who was wow. like, she was like 14, I think. Yeah. Her name was Tamar, I believe. But he was acquitted of that. He fled the country several times and spent 1950 to 1990 in the Philippines. Now, there's more stuff to back all that up. So you're just going to hate this man. And might become convinced you you know who the killer is by the time this is over. Several crime authors, as well as Cleveland detective Peter Morello, have suspected a link between the Black Dahlia murder and the Cleveland Torso murders, which took place in Cleveland, Ohio between 1934 and 1938. As part of their investigation into other murders that took place before and after the Black Dahlia killing, the original LAPD investigators studied the Torso murder in 1947, but later discounted any relationship between the two cases. In 1980, new evidence implicating a former torso murder suspect, Jack Anderson Wilson, aka Arnold Smith, was investigated by Detective St. John in relation to Elizabeth Short's murder. He claimed he was close to arresting Wilson for Miss Short's murder, but that Wilson died in a fire on February 4th, 1982. It literally feels like every time they're one step away from catching the killer, something happens. Happens. conveniently you know they they 
they heavily suspected George uh, Hodel back in the day, and they even went so far as to bug the man's house. He says some, uh, he says some shit. But apparently none of it was enough to actually convict him, or even really, like, get him arrested. Uh... The possible connection between her murder and the Torso murders received renewed media attention when it was profiled on the NBC series Unsolved Mysteries in 1992. Thank you, Unsolved Mysteries and Robert Stack. We love you, Robert Stack. <laughs> and Unsolved Mysteries, just throwing that out there. Anyways, in which Elliot Ness biographer Oscar Fraley suggested Ness knew the identity of the killer responsible for both cases. The February 10th, 1947 murder of Jean French in Los Angeles was also considered by the media and detectives as possibly being connected to Elizabeth Short's killing. Miss French's body was discovered in West Los Angeles on Grandview Boulevard, nude and badly beaten, written on her stomach and lipstick with what appeared to say, Fuck You BD, and the letters T-E-X in all caps below. The Herald Express covered the story heavily and drew comparison to the Elizabeth Short murder less than, less than a month prior, surmising the initials BD to stand for Black Dahlia. According to historian John Lewis, however, the scrawling actually read PD, likely standing for police department. So this this seems like a bunch of like leads that went nowhere. You know, a possible crime they could have, you know, connected her to and maybe it would have been easier because there'd be more evidence from all the other murders to find the killer, but nope, which which kinda sucks because if you if you could have connected her killing to other people's killings and they're all killed by the same person, eventually that person's gonna fuck up. Oh yeah, they always do. That that's what happened to John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, Dahmer, uh BD, BDK? BTK. BTK, sorry. Uh, that's what happened to basically every serial killer we well, know no, about. Well, no, that's not what happened with BTK. BTK got bored and kept sending letters to the police oh. department. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. We'll leave him, we'll, we'll leave him out. That's, uh, that's Dennis Rader, right? Yes. Ha! Ah, look at me remembering. <laughs> But yes, most serial killers get caught because they slip up. Or they they get bored and they do it on purpose. Yeah. They get bored, they do it on purpose, they slip they, they do something they ha okay, they kill so many times, they have so many victims that eventually someone's gonna notice. I mean John Wayne Gacy was because his crawl space started to smell. Uh, you can't kind of hide. The, <laughs> well, kinda of the same for uh Dahmer. Like his apartment fucking stunk it it smelled so bad and he slept up with one of his victims they got away they They got got away brought police back and this motherfucker had like a big ass drum i believe it was like a you know those big gallon drum Mm -hmm. of acid Mm -hmm. in his bedroom just sitting there making people soup that was gross i grossed myself out with that yeah anyway like so i feel i like i like we were saying i feel like if she hadn't just been a one-off like if if he had killed her killer he or she or they whoever if they had killed more people if she could have been connected to other killings and confirmed that's all the same killer i do feel like eventually they would have figured it out but she may have been a one-off but there was a theory and i i don't think it's included in this there was a theory that the person who killed her died very shortly afterwards and everything else that's like everything that's been sent into the police and all that was a hoax or someone taking someone who knew the killer knew that the killer was dead and just tried to take credit for it and it's not like the killer themselves can stop him that's a theory but i didn't i'm not including that like as an actual theory theory because it feels more like a conspiracy theory there's no evidence to back it up crime authors such as steve hodel who we remember as the son of george hodel and william rasmussen have suggested a link between the black dahlia murder and the 1946 murder and dismemberment of six-year-old Suzanne Degnan in Chicago, Illinois, which is just really sad that I have to know about that too. And so do you. <sighs> Jesus Christ. Captain, at, le- at least I don't think they go into detail about it, so I'm okay. I don't do well with uh, children being murdered, I'm sorry. <laughs> or dismembered. Uh, Captain Donahue, uh, Donahoe, sorry, 
of the LAPD stated publicly that he believed the Black Dahlia and the Chicago Lipstick murders were likely connected. Among the evidence cited is the fact that Short's body was found on Norton Avenue, three blocks west of Degnan Boulevard, uh, Degnan Boulevard being named after the little girl. There were also striking similarities between the handwriting on the Degnan ransom note and that of the Black Dahlia Avenger. Both texts used a combination of capitals and small letters. The Degnan uh, note read in part, burn this for her safety, always like alternating lowercase and uppercase. And both notes contain a similar misshapen letter P and have one word that matches exactly. Convicted serial killer William Hirons served life in prison for Degnan's murder. Initially arrested at 17 for breaking into a residence close to that of Degnan, Hirons claimed he was tortured by police, forced to confess, and made a scapegoat for the murder. I'm sure you were, buddy. I mean, that did happen, but at the same time, I don't know who to believe. (laughs) You could have been a killer, or maybe you weren't. After being taken from the medical infirmary at the Dixon Correctional Center on February 26, 2012 for health problems, Hiram died at the University of Illinois Medical Center on March 5, 2012 at 83. Additionally, Steve Hodel has implicated his father, George Hodel, as Short's killer, citing his father's training as a surgeon as circumstantial evidence. In 2003, it was revealed in notes from the 1949 grand jury report and investigators had wiretapped Hodel's home and obtained recorded conversations of him with an unidentified visitor saying, suppose that I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary because she's dead. Why would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> and he says this to an unidentified, someone who visited in his home. He's just like, yeah, maybe I did kill her, but they can't prove it because I also killed my secretary. Essentially, that's what he said. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I know this video is probably pretty long, but if y'all remember, earlier he was suspected of his secretary's death. Like, <laughs> hmm, makes sense to me. If you're the killer, you're also going to kill maybe a witness or somebody who knows something. You're going to mm-hmm. get rid of them too. Like, Jesus Christ. In 1991, Janice Knowlton a woman who was 10 years old at the time of short Wait, also, I, I forgot something real damn quick. I forgot another thing that they recorded him saying. It was believed that he was, like, being zeroed in on, like, they were going to arrest him. And then all of a sudden, they just backed off. And they just said, no, nah, never mind. And he said something around that same time about how he'd, uh, he'd like to make a connection in the DA's office. So it's, it's very widely believed that he bribed him. He bribed somebody to make it all go away. Which kind of also makes you wonder if maybe he did it. Or, you know, because I feel like if you're an innocent man and the police are hounding you for a, for a murder you did not commit. I feel like, a vin- well, maybe not, because that other dude might not have been guilty of uh, that little girl's murder, and he was put in jail. So maybe paying off the police is the only way, or the DA, is the only way to make it all go away if you're innocent. But it also kind of makes you look a bit suspicious. I'm just saying, y'all. So moving on. In 1991, Janice Knowlton, a woman who was 10 years old at the time of, of Elizabeth Short's murder, claimed that she witnessed her father, George Knowlton, beat Short to death with a claw hammer in the detached garage of their family home in Westminster. She also published a book titled Daddy with the Black Dahlia Killer in 1995, in which she made additional claims that her father also molested her. The book was condemned as trash by Knowlton's stepsister, Jolaine Emerson, in 2004, who stated, she believed it, but it wasn't reality. I know, because I lived with her father for 16 years. Which, I feel like that's very invalidating, because you could live with someone, and how many wives of serial killers and rapists and murderers lived with them and didn't know a damn thing until the police came and got them? Maybe her dad didn't kill the Black Dahlia, but maybe he was molesting her. And sitting there and being like, well, I lived with him for 16 years and I didn't see anything. Yeah, that's because you... Why would you? Why would he want you to see anything that he's doing? I'm sorry, it frustrates me when people pull that shit. The whole, well, I didn't see it happen, so clearly it didn't happen. I didn't witness anything like that. Just sit down and shut up and count yourself lucky that he didn't touch you too. I'm sorry. 
These things make me mad. Additionally, Detective St. John told the Times that Knowlton's claims were not consistent with the facts of the Black Dahlia case. John Gilmore's 1994 book, uh, Severed, The True Story of the Black Dahlia Murder, suggests a possible connection between Short's murder and that of Georgette Bowerdorf, a socialite who was strangled to death in her West Hollywood home in 1944. Gilmore suggests that Short's employment at the Hollywood Canteen, where Bowerdorf also worked as a, hotel, a hostess, could be a potential connection between the two women. However, that claim, oh sorry, however, the claim that Short ever worked at the Hollywood Canteen has been disputed by others, such as the retired Times copy editor Larry Harnish. The 2017 book, Black Dahlia, Red Rose, by Pew Eatwell, focuses on Leslie Dillon, a bellhop who was a former mortician's assistant, so that kind of gives him some surgical knowledge, his associate Mark Hansen and Jeff Connors, and Sergeant Finnis Brown, a lead detective who had links to Hansen and was allegedly corrupt. Oh yeah, that's something I meant to mention earlier. It is known that in the 40s and like 50s, and probably for quite a few more decades afterwards, that the LAPD was widely corrupt. Like, you're, we're talking about uh, cops who would take suspects out, out of the police station, or just do it in there too. Beat the shit out of them until they confessed. Uh, some suspects, they just straight up to death. Uh, they would take bribes. They would give bribes. It was just, it was, it was a mess. Eatwell posits that Short was murdered because she knew too much about the men's involvement in a scheme for robbing hotels. She further suggests that Short was killed at the Astor Motel in Los Angeles, where the owners reported finding one of their rooms covered in blood and fecal matter on the morning Short's body was found, which kind of makes sense considering where she was cut. If she'd eaten any kind of recently, there would be waste in her colon. Anyway, the examiner stated in 1949 that L.A. Police Chief William A. Wharton denied that the Flower Street Motel had anything to do with the case, also known as the Ashton Motel. Sorry about that. Uh, although its rival newspaper, the Los Angeles Herald, claimed that the murder took place there, Eatwell is working on a television documentary and a revised edition of her book is due to be released in the autumn of 2018. In the year 2000, Buzz Williams, a retired detective with the Long Beach Police Department, wrote an article for the LBPD newsletter, the rap sheet on Short's murder. William's father, Richard F. Williams, and his friend, Cotton Keller, were both members of LA's gangster squad investigating the case. Williams Sr. believed that Dylan was the killer, and that when Dylan returned to his home state of Oklahoma, he was able to avoid extradition to California because his ex-wife, Georgia Stevenson, was second cousin with Governor Adlai Stevenson II of Illinois, who contacted the governor of Oklahoma on Dylan's behalf. Keller believed Hanson was the killer, as he had studied at a surgical school in Sweden and had thrown elaborate parties attended by prominent LAPD officials. Williams' article says that Dylan sued the LAPD for $3 million, but that the suit was dropped. Harnish disputes this, claiming that Dylan was cleared by police after an exhaustive investigation, and that the district attorney's files positively placed him in San Francisco when Short was killed. Harnish claimed that there was no LAPD cover-up, and that Dylan did in fact receive a financial settlement from the city of Los Angeles, but has not produced concrete evidence to prove this. Numerous details regarding Stuart's personal life and death have been pointed to public dispute. The eager involvement of both the public and press on solving her murder have been credited as factors that complicated the investigation significantly, resulting in a complex, sometimes inconsistent, narrative of events. According to Amory Di Stefano of the Portland Tribune, many unsubstantiated stories have circulated about Short over the years. She was a prostitute, she was frigid, she was pregnant, she was a lesbian. And somehow, instead of fading away over time, the legend of the Black Dahlia just keeps getting more convoluted. Harnish has refuted several support, uh, several supposed rumors and popular conceptions about Short and her murder, and also disputed the validity of Gilmore's book, Severed, claiming the book is 25% mistakes and 50% fiction. Harnish also had examined the district attorney's files. He claimed that Steve Hodel, Hodel, 
has examined some of them pertaining to his father, along with Times columnist Steve Lopez. And contrary to Eatwell's claims, the files show that Dylan was thoroughly investigated and was determined to have been in San Francisco when Elizabeth Short was killed. Harnish speculated that Eatwell either did not find these files or she chose to ignore them. So, a number of people, none of none of whom knew Short, uh, uh, contacted police and the newspapers and claimed to have seen her during her so-called missing week between her January 9th disappearance and the discovery of her body on January 15th. Police and DA investigators wrote out each alleged sighting. In some cases, those interviewed were identifying other women they had mistaken for Miss Short. Her whereabouts on the days leading up to her murder and the discovery of her body are still unknown. After, after the discovery of her body, numerous LA newspapers printed headlines claiming she had been tortured, which we talked about earlier, leading up to her death. This was denied by law enforcement at the time, but apparently they just kept allowing the claims to circulate. So they were based, so I guess they were basically something going, nope, that didn't happen, but keep telling people it did. Uh, some sources, such as Oliver's, Oliver Cyrax's Crime, an encyclopedia, state that Short's body was covered in cigarette burns inflicted, inflicted on her while she was still alive, although there is no indication of it in her official autopsy report. Uh, in a severed, Gilmore states that the coroner who performed Short's autopsy suggested in conversation that she had been forced to consume fecal matter you know, based on his findings when examining the contents of her stomach. This claim has been denied by Harnish and is also not indicated in her official autopsy either, although it has been reprinted in several print and online media. So people are basically just coming out of left field with a bunch of random shit about her, what happened to her. None of which seems to tie into the actual autopsy report. And it's just kind of like, it's almost, to me, it's almost as bad as the people who claim, you know, who do false confessions. Because it's like, you're not helping. You're not helping at all. You're just hindering the fucking investigation by throwing out all this random crap that you don't even, just because you think it's what happened, doesn't mean that it's the truth. Stop trying to present it as fact. So, uh, it's just some interesting information about the name the Black Dahlia name. According to newspaper reports shortly after the murder, uh, she received the nickname Black Dahlia from staff and patrons at a Long Beach drugstore. In mid-1946, mid this word play on the film The Blue Dahlia. Other popularly circulated rumors claim that the media crafted the name due to her adorning her hair with dahlias. According to the FBI official website, she received the, per- the first part of the nickname from the press for her rumored po- penchant for sheer black clothes. Prior to the circulation of the Black Dahlia name, Short's killing had been dubbed the Werewolf Murder by the uh, Herald Express due to the brutal nature of the crime. And so we also have... um She's got alleged prostitution and sexual history. Many true crime books claim that she lived in or visited L.A. at various times in the mid-40s, including Gilmore Severed, which claims she worked at the Hollywood Canteen, which, again, was not proven. And in fact, I believe it was entirely disputed. Yeah, this is disputed by Harnish, who states that Short did not, in fact, live in L.A. or Los Angeles until after the canteen's closing in 1945. Although some of her acquaintances and several authors and journalists described Short as a prostitute or a call girl during her time in L.A. According to the Harness, the grand jury proved that there was no existing evidence that she was ever a prostitute. Harness claims that the rumors regarding Short's history as a prostitute originates from John Gregory Dunn's 1977 novel True Confessions, which is based in part on the crime. Another widely circulated rumor, sometimes used to counter claims that she was a prostitute, holds that she was unable to have sex because of a congen- congenital defect that resulted in gonadal dysgenesis, also known as infantile genitalia. Los Angeles County District Attorney's file states that the investigators had questioned three men with whom Short had engaged in sex, including a ch- Chicago police officer who was a suspect in the case. FBI files on the case also contain a statement from one of Short's alleged lovers. Short's autopsy itself, which was reprinted in full in Michael Newton's 2009 book, The Encyclopedia of Unsolved Crime, notes that her uterus was small, However, no other information in the autopsy is provided that would suggest her reproductive organs were anything other than anatomically normal. Jesus Christ, they just would not leave this, per- this woman alone in any part. 
the autopsy also states that Short was not and had never been pregnant, contrary to what had been claimed prior to and following her death. Another rumor that Short was a lesbian has often circulated, according to Gilmore. This rumor began after Bevo means of, that's a hell of a name, Bevo means of the Herald Express were told by the deputy coroner that Short wasn't having sex with men due to her purportedly small genitalia. Means took this to mean that Short had sex with women, and both he and reporter Sid Hughes began fruitlessly investigating gay bars in LA for further information which never proven, so pointless time-wasting on your part there, my dude. Elizabeth Short is interred at the Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland. After her younger sisters had grown up and married, their mother Phoebe moved to Oakland to be near her daughter's grave. She finally returned to the East Coast in the 1970s, where she lived into her 90s. On February 2nd, 1947, just two weeks after Short's murder, Republican State Assemblyman C. Don Field was prompted by the case to introduce a bill calling for the formation of a sex offender registry. The state of California would become the first U.S. state to make the registration of sex offenders mandatory. So there's some good coming from her death here. Short's murder has been described as one of the most brutal and culturally enduring crimes in American history, and Time magazine listed it as one of the most inf- infamous unsolved cases in the world. Her life and death have been the basis of numerous books and films, both fictionalized and nonfiction. The case was the focus of season 4, episode 13, of Hunter, in which the main characters, along with a fictitious veteran former police detective, investigated and carried out an arrest of an in reality fictitious suspect after 41 years. Elizabeth Short was portrayed here by Jessica Nelson. Among the most famous fictional accounts of Short's death is James Elroy's 1987 novel The Black Dahlia, which in addition to the murder explored the larger fields of politics, crime, corruption, and paranoia in post-war Los Angeles, according to the cultural critic David M. Fine. Elroy's novel was adapted into a 2006 film of the same name by actor Brian De Palma. Short was played by actress, actress Mia Kirshner. Both the novel and the film adaptation bear little relation to the facts of the case, however. Short was also portrayed in heavily fictionalized account by several other people, and she was also, she had like a bit of a cameo in American Horror Story in 2011, and yeah, she was in there in the episode Spooky Little Girl, and again in 2018 with Return to Murder House. So, you know, she had kind of a shitty life, and she died horrifically and was brutalized after her death, but at the very least, some good did come out of her death, you know, because the sex offender registry was created more or less because of her. And I think that that's a huge win, even if she is not alive to see that win. I think it's a very tragic story, very, very brutal. And I I personally believe that George Hodel most likely is the killer, but until it's confirmed or properly denied i don't think we'll ever know how do you feel (laughs) any closing thoughts um yeah i I think i agree i think that he did it it seemed i mean he he pretty much came out and said it even if i don't know maybe he was an asshole and he knew he was being bugged and he said it that way or he had no clue and he thought it was safe to say it to some random person and (laughs) You know, we'll never know. Dude's dead, but... A random person who he probably also killed. Now, I could go into George Hodel a lot more. And pr- there is a lot. I didn't. I haven't even scratched the surface of the potential evidence that he did it. Such as... And I'll just throw this in there, just, just because it's interesting, I guess. Their house that they lived in had a secret room. I believe it was the basement room that they weren't allowed to go into. So, <laughs> I mean, and and if he did kill his secretary, who even know what she did to him? And it doesn't help answer the question of what the fuck could Elizabeth Short have done to warrant that? Oh, there was also um, there's so much, there is so much I could tell you about, but this video is very long. Uh, if y'all want us, me, us, whoever, to go into more details about George uh, Hodel and what his son found and what you know the children remember, let us know. We may do that. And, uh, you know, because why not? There, I'm not kidding. There is so much more about the possibility of George Hodel being the killer that once you see it all and hear it all, it's really hard to ignore it. But for now, I am 
closing this case file. I hope everyone has enjoyed it. If I have uh, gotten anything wrong, I'm sorry. I'm just going off of my sources and what I've read so far. There is so much more information out there. I encourage everyone to do their research. But for now, we're saying goodbye. And we hope y'all enjoy this. We hope that, you know, it wasn't too bad for y'all out there. Because there were some parts that were difficult to stomach. Even for me, the person who wanted to do this video. But yeah, and we hope y'all have a lovely day. Please subscribe if you like our content and want to see more like it. Feel free to comment down below, like a case you want to see us do. You know, like the video if you like it. If you don't like it, then, you know, I guess you could dislike it. That's fine too. But uh, goodbye for now and stay spooky.